Welcome to the Cheska Human Rights Commission meeting for Thursday, June 27th, 2019. And we'll just start out with calling the roll. All right, so Councilmember Spread, or I'm sorry, Commissioner, it's not Councilmember. Commissioner Spreadberry is not yet here. Uh, Commissioner Scarborough is not yet here. Commissioner Leggett uh, says that he's going to be absent today. And Commissioner Carlson is not yet here. And I'll begin with the folks who are here. Commissioner Dunbar? Here. Commissioner Welvert? Here. Commissioner Bean? Here. Commissioner Haga? Present. And Commissioner White? Here. All right. And we do have enough. There's four needed for um, a quorum, so we've got, we've got that mark met More and surpassed, enough. so we're good to go. Okay. Um, we'll go to item two, adopting the agenda. Do I have a motion to adopt tonight's agenda? I'll motion to adopt the agenda. I'll second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 The agenda has been adopted for tonight. And we'll move on to open forum guest presentation. Tonight we have Stacy Nelson Kumar here. She's going to talk to us about a video and show us a little piece of it. And then we'll have time for questions afterwards. Thank you. Thanks. So I'll just do a brief introduction of myself. I know some of you, but not everyone. I'm Stacey Nelson Kumar. I'm a resident of Chaska and have been a resident for the past seven years. And I'm also involved in some of the um, events around uh, discrimination and racism in the community and in our schools. And so have um, a video that I I've watched that was really profound in my own understanding of race. And so I wanted to share it tonight with uh, the hopes of asking the Human Rights Commission to consider hosting it as a community forum, as a community session, uh, as an education opportunity for other members of the community. So I have a, a handout to share, but I thought what we'd do first is start with a brief uh, trailer of the video series. It's a PBS series that was done in the early 2000s, um, and it, it's dated. It looks like it was done in the early 2000s. The content is really profound, and I know that the PBS station that originally filmed it in California has actually just relaunched it for in 2019, so they're actively trying to um, promote it again. Um, so it's still relevant. The idea of race assumes that simple external differences rooted in biology are linked to other more complex internal differences, like athletic ability, musical aptitude, intelligence. This belief is based on the idea that race is biologically real. 
genetics now is telling us that that's not the case. We can't find any genetic markers that are in everybody of a particular race and in nobody of some other race. We can't find any genetic markers that define race. And actually, what we're going to generate are billions of copies of a little section of your, of your genetic code. These students are gathering for a DNA workshop led by Cold Spring Harbor Labs teacher Scott Bronson. Marcus, Gorgeous, Jackie, Noah, Hannah, Jamil, and their fellow students are about to explore the biology of human variation. There's another type of DNA. Does anybody know what that type of DNA is? Yeah. I don't know. Mitochondrial DNA, very good. They will compare their skin colors. <laughs> they will type their blood. And they will swap cells from inside their mouths to extract a small portion of their own DNA. Once the sample is ready, they will compare some of their genetic similarities and differences. The students begin the workshop with the same assumptions most of us have. As you begin to look at the data, you might want to keep in your mind who you think you might be most similar to and who you think you might be most different to. I think I probably have the most similarities with uh, Mr. Bronson or with Carol because we were white males, both Carol and I and both Scott Bronson and I. I think I have the most differences with Carol and the most similarities with Grace. She is an African American. I mean, like, black. I think maybe me and Natalia are most alike. She's Latin American, and I'm Latin American. I figured that there would be tons of differences, especially with people who looked so different. To understand why the idea of race is a biological myth requires a major paradigm shift, an absolute paradigm shift, a shift in perspective. And for me, it's like seeing, you know, what it must have been like to understand that the world isn't flat. And perhaps I can invite you to a mountaintop, and you can look out the window and at the horizon and see, oh, what I thought was flat, I can see a curve in now, that the world is much more complicated. In fact, that race is not based on biology, but race is rather an idea that we ascribe to biology. Thank you. So I have a handout I wanted to share um, that includes a user guide for this video series, as well as just some notes on the request I'm making tonight uh, for your consideration. So what you saw in the trailer was really five minutes, a five-minute synopsis of three different episodes. So the first episode, uh, each episode is about 90, is about 75 to 90 minutes. The first episode is sort of looking at the history of race. The second episode is um, looking more at the narrative that we have around race. And the third episode is looking at some of the systemic um, examples of where race is, has uh, you know, created policies and procedures. And so um, in, in looking at the opportunities for our community, this video really came to mind because, as I mentioned, it was really an a impactful learning experience for me as a white middle class woman. And I think that um, others who were part of the, the original conversation were also profoundly struck. Um, I participated in a session with um, Nancy Brady, who some of you may know, she is the executive director of the Neighborhood House in, in St. Paul, actually. Um, and she was facilitating the conversation around these videos, and so I was a part of that. I think it could be helpful to Chaska. We've got um, a lot of activities taking place with the school district. Also, the city has um, brought a group together uh, to look at opportunities for community engagement around race and discrimination. But I think this particular opportunity is, is well suited for the Human Rights Commission to consider because it's truly an educational opportunity. It's a way to bring people together. It helps, I think, meet some of the mission of the Human Rights Commission, helps build some of those relationships that you're proactively seeking to do. Um, and also, like I said, it provides an educational opportunity. 
I think the video itself is really important, but the other aspect is a facilitated conversation. So the idea would be that we host uh, three different sessions, each time showing one of the episodes uh, of the series, then uh, have a chance for people to gather, have a little you know, social time, watch the video, and then have a facilitated discussion. Depending on the size of the group, I think that could be one large discussion or we could break it out into smaller discussions. And I also would advise, recommend that we have it facilitated by um, someone from outside of Chaska who has expertise in those kinds of discussions. It's sometimes an uncomfortable topic because it does, as the trailer said, it does um, just, it calls a lot into question. It, it just, uh, a lot of our, the norms that we may have learned, um, it, it shows information to consider otherwise. And so I think um, the facilitation is really important. So you have extra sheets in your packets. Apologies for that. We had a miscommunication with the copy machine. But what you can see in there are some of the questions that are <laughs> proposed. That was my fault. <laughs> Some of the questions that the, this is the user guide for this series um, that PBS has put together. And so the, the, uh, you rec they have several recommendations in here, uh, you know, for consideration. They're not all necessary, I would think, but um, they do, I think, have some really thoughtful questions that are natural to follow watching the video that could be part of that facilitated conversation. So ideally, we would have an opportunity to have these shown during the summer. And I know we're here at the end of June already, so looking at July and August, a chance to um, put those together for the community. I listed out some potential partners that I know of with an interest in, in this type of community conversation. Um, I mentioned City of Chaska and Eastern Carver County Schools already. The school district owns the video series and would um, loan it to the Human Rights Commission for showing. And then with the city's partnership, thinking that maybe there is the space that could be used at the Chaska Event Center. Other um, organizations we've had some uh, relation with, I'm um, part of the Residents Organizing Against Racism group, and I know that's a group too that would be willing to help promote um, the events as they are scheduled. I think that's a role that some of the other partners could play too, is just helping to drive attendance to the event. The facilitation partners, I just have a couple of um, connections in the community that I listed there, but I think there's certainly opportunity to consider you know, anyone else who has an expertise, I think, in, in this particular area. I think that's really important. But as I mentioned, I've worked with Nancy Brady before. Um, Jonathan Palmer is um, well known in this area. He leads the Hallie Q. Brown Community Center, also in St. Paul. And then the YWCA Minneapolis, YMCA Twin Cities, and Science Museum all have equity and inclusion departments. Uh, with focus and with facilitated, with trained facilitators that are part of them, that are also potential resources for for us uh, to look to. The budget I just put together an idea of what I thought. Obviously, um, very drafts, very much an estimate, but I really think that the primary expenses would be around promotion if we wanted to have anything printed for the promotion. I think a lot of the other promotion would happen via email and social media. Um, so I thought if there's a need for promotion, for printed promotions, and then if we were to pay a facilitator, pay, have to pay that facilitator thinking um, a nominal amount each time, $50 each time for a total of $150. So that would be my, what I would expect of the expenses. I think refreshments are a nice addition to the event and then potentially we could get those donated by a local, like by a local business. The metrics of success, I, I mean, I think as we think about this, and I've had conversations with other, um, friends and colleagues in the community, um, it's a little hard to, to quantify what we feel like would be a successful event. Um, but in my mind, I think if we had you know, 50 people attend and then the word spread and we got 50 new people at the next one and just continue to grow uh, the audience, that that would be a successful event. Um, maybe that's too high. Um, I, I think depending on how we've had other community events and what you would expect for um, participation, that would be um, insight I'd love to hear from you. The other aspects I think were just those, you know, those conversations with a facilitated discussion would be dignified and respectful and well managed um, and that new community relationships would be developed as a result of this education series. So the um, packet is for you to peruse. There's information in there about each of the series or each of the episodes and like I said with the questions and then additional resources and sources are listed in there as well. 
Um, but would ask for your consideration to have the Human Rights Commission uh, host three sessions over the next several weeks uh, as a community education forum. Thank you. Happy to take any questions. Uh, I have a question. When you, when you say host, do you want us to provide the funding for it, or do you want us to be there to do something? Both. I think provide the funding for uh, for it to happen with those costs that may be associated with the event. But then I think as as the host of the event that the Human Rights Commission members would it'd be an important place for you to be and and be seen and, and bring your own networks to attend. I think the fifth you were talking about the fifty people Mm -hmm. and wondering about what we've had for other things. We've had about 100 at the, at the MLK breakfast that we started a couple years ago. So I think 50 is a realistic number to expect, you know, if we reach out to maybe some of the people who have come to that. I, yeah, mm -hmm. I, think, I think the 50, um, the objective to grow it, I think it's a, to grow it by 50 or 50 new attendees each mm -hmm. event. Um, that might be challenging, but it's it's a worthy goal. Um, so just based on the, the MLK event, I think that's probably a good measure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, another one <clears throat> to look at would be, um, what did we call that, with, with Judy Meisel, um, the Holocaust mm -hmm. um, event that was held. Mm -hmm. um, that, that was very well attended, um, but that was, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if that's a good comparison for this or not. But you know, we had a Holocaust survivor mm -hmm. there presenting and talking about her story. It was very compelling. Mm -hmm. um, so that drew very good attendance. So I, maybe it's somewhere in the middle of that. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I think, um, as I mentioned, you know, it's three episodes, and there's certainly benefit to attending all three. But it's not required. I mean, it's not like you have to see the first one in order to really make sense of the second. And so I wonder, you know, I, I would hope that the original 50 would continue to come to all three sessions as their schedules permitted, but that they would then bring a friend or spread the word about, you know, how, how much they got out of it and to grow it. But it's helpful to know sort of how, how other events have happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if there was 50 people that did come or more, mm -hmm. do you think one facilitator is enough? I would break it into smaller groups, honestly. I think there's more value in having the, the opportunity to really be in a more intimate setting for some of the conversation. So, but I think that depends, too, on the availability of facilitators um, and the cost. So ideally, you'd have 10 people in a group you know, to have a conversation around a table, and so that would require at least one main facilitator, like I could see from one of these organizations, but then maybe some other trained volunteers from the community that could help guide those individual discussions at the table. But I think the main facilitator could help to outline you know, the intent and outline the main questions, but then there's someone at the table who also understands the, the intent of the conversation. That'd be my, that's been successful at the other, in my experience in the other places I've been. I was just thinking in terms of budget, if we would have to do 150 or whatever for each facilitator, if we had a large group of people there. Yeah because that could go up very quickly. True, true. And I, I mean, I think that there's also always the opportunity to ask for pro bono help. So it's, it's estimated in there, but I don't. Can you grab your microphone bring it a little closer to yourself there? There's um, always that potential is to say, would you be willing to do this pro bono for our community? Okay. Are you the person that will be looking for the facilitators? I w I'm happy to assist, um, but would take your guidance as, as the hosts. I have, con I have contacts at these organizations. I've worked with them before. Um, I work in corporate community relations, and we do a lot of funding. Um, I do a lot of our nonprofit management, and so I have uh, partnership management. And so I've worked, um, done a lot of funding in the race and equity and inclusion space, and so that's how I've met many of um, these organizations and their contacts. So happy to, to assist with that. mentioned having this happen this summer. Mm -hmm. um, where did that come from, that time frame? 
So um, we know that the, you know, the, the school year will begin here in just a couple of weeks, as crazy as that sounds, but hoping to have some community dialogue or some community education at an advance of the school year starting. And I know the school district has also been thinking about you know, how do they start the school year um, with some dialogue or with some family events um, to help get off to a good start. So that was the, the framework for the timing, um, having it happen in the summer. Has the district employees already seen this or they purchased it? The district purchased it, I think just recently received it and there's a plan uh, for, or maybe they have, I'll defer to Kaylee. Yeah, so Clint for sure has seen, there's several of us who have seen it personally um, and whether or not it's used as part of a training, I know that for the community leaders, I think it's gonna be part of mm -hmm. that training, but in terms of district staff, that has not been yet part of it, but I don't see why it wouldn't be. But I've seen it, Clint has seen it, um, and can speak to the value of it. You thought it was valuable? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I have it in my purse right now, because Kelly brought it oh. to me to take a look at, too. It, I mean, it just arrived last week, so. Sure. Yeah. You can give more input on it after I've seen it. Have you spoken to the city about the space and, and using the... No, I have not it? yet. Just knowing that we have had um, common um, interest, I think, with the city level, so maybe I would defer to Nate, but... Um, yeah, I would have to, to take here. a look at... I know that the event center, for example, is a very busy place, and mm -hmm. often you need to look, up, look ahead a little bit. So I, I can't speak tonight about what the availability is of that space. I think... One thing to think about is, you know, if the attendance is something in the neighborhood of 50, um, does it need to be the event center? Are there other locations that could um, meet that need and maybe would be more available? Like we've got um, different rooms at the community center mm -hmm. um, that can be used. Um, there's also churches the that have space and things. Or so spaces maybe, yeah. the schools too. Right. Right. Yeah. So we, I think. Right. We can Long story cost, short, so I, think there, I think there's yeah, a way to find a space to do it. Um, it's just that having flexibility on the space beyond the event center, I think, would help. Absolutely. And the, the suggestion of the event center, is, uh, event center is, one, that it's beautiful and can accommodate larger groups, and two, that it's very neutral space. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's the other issue, is just it's a place where everybody can access it, everybody feels welcome. Um, and that may be true of other locations, too, but I think sometimes that's not always the case, and so making sure it's a place that people do feel welcome to come. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the community center is a good idea for a neutral space. Mm -hmm. um, churches are often willing to let people use the space, but that's not always, it's a little intimidating to some sure. people to show up there. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm excited oh, to watch the full video yeah. and see how that yeah. goes. I'll be anxious to hear what you think. So, thank you very much. Any final questions I can answer? Or no? So, I guess the, the question becomes, if this is something that we want to do in July, we probably need to, we need to act make that decision. That. Yeah. Right. Um. So one, one thing to consider here as you're trying to make a decision or thinking things through is we do have, um, since this could have some budget implications, we've got a couple discussion items tonight. Well, the treasurer's report is one, but then another is um, the new business item about the Chaska Farmer's Market and thinking about multi-ethnic um, entertainment that um, we're looking at to do there. So there could be dollars that may go towards that. It might be useful to get through some of those conversations, kind of get a sense of where we're going and weigh options um, and determine what, you know, what makes sense. Maybe this should be 7B, new business. <laughs> we, yeah, we can talk about it, new business. Um, since we've adopted the agenda, I guess we can't officially add a 7B, but um, new business is, op is often an open forum anyway, so we can definitely do it there. Okay, so we'll right. discuss this later in the meeting some more? That's, I would suggest that. That might make sense and help you kind of okay. think through everything else and, and have that bigger picture perspective for You're it. You're welcome so. to stay or you can go. I will actually your excuse kids. myself, but yeah. really thank you all for the opportunity to share it and appreciate your um, willingness to consider. So, I'll, if, if, and if there are other questions that I can answer about it, I'm happy, happy to do that. Other places I can be a resource. Happy to do that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stacy. Stacey. Thanks, Stacey.
Okay, so we'll set this aside till later. Mm -hmm. And um, has everyone had a chance to look through the minutes from the last meeting? Yeah, I have a ch uh, correction. <gasps> Boom. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, he was on his own. Yeah. He was the minute. Well, I just yeah. think that. Uh, Corrections I, are important to be accurate. So. A, on the first page, I don't believe, I think flyer is F L Y E R for that kind of flyer. Oh. But on, on um, number 6C, that sentence just doesn't read. White stated that the giveaway items still have plenty except for the fans. Six, I, I know what you're trying to say, but... Oh, that we still have enough of the items, we just need to get more fans. Right. It's just not worded very well. Okay. So, White stated that we have enough giveaway items except for the fans. That would be good. Okay. Usually it's me. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't get to point it out very often, do you? Okay, I can make that change. I move to approve the minutes as amended. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. The motion is carried, and we have an amendment to our minutes. So that brings us to the treasurer's report whenever Nate is finished with his notes. Yes. Treasurer's report. So we had an expense in June this month, um, $325 uh, for the giveaway Human Rights Commission logoed fans, um, which was an expense approved at the previous meeting. meeting. So. Um, those will be on the way. They'll be available for um, River City Days, which is the intent for those. Um, but adding that expense, we are now at $1,630.13 in our budget amount. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Okay, we'll move on to item 6A um, and discuss the River City Days booth. Uh, we already know that fans will be coming soon. <laughs> yep. if, if, we, if we do want candy, I did print out some stuff. I think Nate likes to actually buy it <laughs> because you have the... Yeah, but I there's can, stuff like if we wanted candy like Lemonheads because we're going to be bright yellow too. It's like... 20 bucks for three pounds of individually wrapped little ones. Okay, and we already approved that in the amount mm -hmm. that we were going to spend on our Yeah, you know, days. if uh, if there's specific recommendations for candy, I can do that. I guess my thought would be I'd just go over to Cooper's, um, which is typically what we do. Go where? Um, to, do we, do we want to stick so. with yellow or just get whatever? Um, I don't think those lemon drops are a real big. That's what I was wondering kids. about. Yeah, I think we're better with miscellaneous at Cooper's. Okay. Let's put our trust in Nate to go to Cooper's. I do have a sweet tooth, so I, I'm glad you trust me to pick out candy. A discerning sweet tooth. I'm honored that you trust me to actually bring the candy to the event and no. eat it. <laughs> I'll do my best. Well, this is a test. Yes, I hope we'll I can We'll see how pass. it goes. Yeah. If it's a really warm day, don't get chocolate. I'll avoid the chocolate. The chocolate is the thing that I'm most likely to eat as well, so I'll, I'll stay oh, away from that. Oh, if it's 90 degrees, yeah, you don't want yeah. chocolate somewhere. We can do some suckers or something. Okay. Yeah, I think we should have some candy or something. That's fun. Um, and then as far as the booth, um, I did talk to Nate about that we will bring the um, Human Rights Award winner plaque that on Friday, and then um, we'll keep it under lock and key overnight and bring it back each day. Mm -hmm. um, only Saturday, I guess, since we're not doing Sunday. But, um, and then 
Also, you said you could bring some water. Mm -hmm. And um, we also need the Human Rights Award um, nomination forms. Or, ah, yes. So can you please bring those? I'll have some available. Updated? Yeah. Oh, yeah, updated with the newest winners on them. And then um, Judy had said that she was going to talk to the census people about some lit that we could have at our booth for the census. Do you want to talk I about that? that? Sure. Um, so I went over to the census place and office in St. Paul, and they are running low on swag, swag but they said there could be more. Um, before our thing, so I'm supposed to call them back. But what they gave me was um, some of these that we could put in our booth. I think there's four of them, actually. And um, they gave me, I think there's five T-shirts. They're um, all extra large. But you can help yourself. And they gave me a bunch of buttons, which we can pass out. At the booth. Um, and then as far as the, the uh, brochures, they didn't have actual like brochures to pass out, but she sent me some things that we could print. And one of them is um, the census is hiring and information on if anybody is looking for a job. And it says that they pay 14 to 20 dollars per an hour. so. Uh, that might be one thing, and then they sent out, or they sent me this, the 2020 Census and Confidentiality, and it it talks all, all over how um, your responses are secure, that they can't be used for anything else, and so I thought that would be a reassuring um, piece to have for a lot of our community. Those would be good for us to read through, too, so we yes. can talk a little bit more about it. And then um, this is the We Count, which uh, talks about how much um, per Minnesotan is money is generated to the state for the, the um, census, and then what the funding that goes for each, for various programs of um, the SNAP program, medical assistance, et cetera. Thing. So um, I didn't make copies of these for everybody, but what I thought was I could email you, I can give this to you, or I could email the e-copy e of it, and you could print out, I don't know, maybe 50 or something of each one to have at a booth. What do you yeah, that'd be fine. I, mean, I, was, I was sort of playing around on the census uh, website as well. There's a whole lot of um, handouts and pre-made brochures on different topics, including the ones that, yep. you, that you're talking about, Judy. Oh. So, you know, I, could, I can do those. Um, there's other information about what to expect um, to receive in the mail or, you know, how, how to participate in the census and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, Maybe so it, it's all free, yeah. so you can just, we can print it out. Do they have them translated too? Um, that's what I was just going to um, say. They, they're working on getting them translated into different languages, but um, so I'm going to keep checking back with yeah. them. Hopefully by the end of July we can yeah. find some. Yeah. Um, the other thing, I don't know if you guys saw, but today the U.S. Supreme Court ruled yeah. against including citizenship as a question on the census, so that's, yes. it goes in hand in hand with the confidentiality piece that exactly. nobody's going to be exactly. giving up information that could be used against them. So. Right. Well, I think so, that's some good stuff um, to have. That's what I have. Not... Yeah, if, if you want to send me the electronic copies, that would work out best to print out, you know, nice quality copies for yep. the booth. Okay. Do we want to, we had the big boards last year with like just a few bullet points of statistics and stuff like that. Are we, do we want to do something like that this year? I was I looking at the one that you had of like, uh, the numbers, the yeah. No, yeah, like that one. where it goes, like what the state gets for each person that's counted. 
I think that that might be a good poster, you know, good visual of why it's important. Or even if we had bullet points of why it's important or something, um, just real short. Yeah, I didn't bring, but I have a notebook that I had made up before with a bunch of um, census stuff, like you were noting. Um, we could cut and paste a lot of different things off of those and, and come up with a poster. I'd be happy to do that. Um, you made such a lovely poster last yeah. year. If you would like to yeah. do it again, I would love you to do it. Um, yeah, sure. And then I, I also have a, a, a book, not the one that he gave us, but I printed one off on, on Minnesota Census that has a lot of data that we can just have at the booth in case we get questions that we don't know the answer to. You can just look it up in there. The Census Bureau provides nice kind of one-pagers about specific communities. So Chaska is one. Um, that could be printed out and made available. It just gives out, you know, what is the total population, some breakdowns about income, um, you know, race and ethnicity makeup, um, age breakouts, things like that. Um, fairly, I think you know, that would basic make a level good information. So poster to like go that. alongside, like, this is what Chaska is, and then one that says, if you if for each person counted, we mm -hmm. get this much, you know, so like have two posters. Sure. Yeah, I could, I could work on the census one or I'll probably ask our intern to help with that, but yeah, he's looking for good work. It's <laughs> a good idea. I think that would be great. I mean, no. I don't think we need too much on the posters, just mm -hmm. something to grab people's attention and then mm -hmm. we can talk with them. Mm -hmm. And I think the poster boards that Judy, yeah. Judy has also are very colorful and should draw people in as well. Yes. To use those. Um, did we have more discussion on that? <clears throat> no. Okay. I was just going to say before I forget to, um, I brought the sign up sheet again for if you want to work um, a shift or two. and. The only person here who's not on it right now is Kelly because you weren't here last time. Right. And then I think what I'll do is type it up and have Nate send it out for the people who haven't been able to be here. Mm -hmm. And we can adjust it through electronic yep. communication. Yeah, we can we can sign up and people and just kinda of let me know, you know, what times they want and we can do that. So we Google Doc. Yeah. Okay. I feel like we're pretty well set with the River City Day booth. I, think I feel so pretty too. good about it. We've had our subcommittee meetings. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, we try. <laughs> I, th I think that we set up a good system last year and it's kind of falling into place now. That Type that up, Nate, or would you like to just take that with you and then? I can take well, it with me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I will get it shared. Sorry. Please call me a booth buddy. <laughs> okay. Anything else about River City Days? Um, we'll move on to 6B and um, kind of circle back to last month when we talked about the Census Complete Count Committee. Um, and Nate has included a report in our packet. Um, but would you like to talk about what Yeah, I can kind of summarize what I wrote. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is following up on last month's meeting uh, where representative from the U.S. Census Bureau, Jim Accurso, uh, came to talk to us about complete count committees and, you know, just kind of generally how communities can help promote the U.S. Census um, and, you know, what, what's all behind that. So 
out of that, we had, I think, a pretty good discussion last meeting about what could be done for the city of Chasco, what might make sense. There were some questions. I went back and did a little work to, to learn a little bit more about what the city has done in the past. I think that was one of the biggest questions. Um, acknowledging that, I think Jim shared last time that um, the city had an 85% participation rate and then was able to get to 100%. So I think the question was what, what occurred to have that success and, and what makes sense from there. So what I learned is that we have a group of staff who maintain a really close relationship um, with the US Census Bureau and people from our community development department, um, our public works department, parks department, um, the police department, um, and help to identify locations like new neighborhoods that have come online in the recent, um, you know, within the last year that maybe the Census Bureau hasn't made, obtained those records or something. So extra attention is needed there. Neighborhoods where um, there are concentrated populations of folks who are harder to reach. Um, we're very aware of that at a staff level because we work directly with them frequently, especially across the different departments. Mm -hmm. um, the Parks Department in particular, our maintenance staff are very familiar. Um, with locations where people are living homeless. Um, they come across that very frequently because they're out maintaining the parks and that's often a place where people are going. Um, and we also maintain a lot of relationships with um, nonprofit groups in the community who are serving people who might be harder to reach. So whether they be you know, folks that are speaking another language or elderly people um, or you know, people that are new to the country or, or homeless, I mean, we've got ongoing relationships with organizations that are working with all those groups of people. So they also have familiarity and things to contribute. So fortunately, we live in a community that's very active in, partic in just participating to start with. Um, I think that's a factor of the makeup of our community and maybe good fortune. Um, but then once we get to that harder to reach population, it's those ongoing relationships and you know staff connecting with the US Census Bureau that we've able, we've been pretty successful um, in the past few censuses um, of achieving that 100% count. So when I'm, think when I'm thinking about what is a good role for the Human Rights Commission and where can you all contribute, um, I think it's really the promotion side. So I think it's exactly what um, Commissioner Dunbar is putting together for the Human Rights Commission's um, booth at the River City Days. And then maybe thinking about how do you take that next step with that. So how do you take information um, like these brochures and things that we're able to hand out and um, maybe distribute that more broadly through the community, through the networks that you have or the groups that you're participating in, uh, bringing them to churches and working with, with them maybe to talk about it um, with their Sunday service or something like that. I'm just, you know, these are just ideas. Um, community groups and attending their meetings and providing um, you know, some information to other community leaders who might then help spread the word, um, working with some of these nonprofits that are engaged with these communities um, ahead of time to help them be able to speak with their clients about why the census is important. I think there's a lot of ways to do that and promote the census ahead of time to help people understand what to anticipate and understand why it's important and then understanding about the confidentiality piece of it too. I think that's another really important one. Um, so thinking about the complete count committee, um, that would be an extra step uh, that could be taken and I think that does open up the opportunity for some additional training. Um, there's a three hour training. Um, I understand that complete count committees can access and really get dive into the details of a census and how that works and how the data is used and how, it's get put, how it gets put together for consumption and that kind of thing. Um, so that there could be value in that, but the con I guess the thing that I wonder is, given the time that we have, um, we would need to identify who's participating in the complete count committee, so there would be time needed to figure that out, connect with people, identify who the people are that we're even asking, um, you know, work with the council to get that approval for it, think about what is the, um, you need to, I would, well, I guess I would recommend that the committee would have a clear charge and objective to it, um, and also a predetermined schedule of meetings, at least an estimate of what that would look like so people understand what it is they're committing to. Um, 
So there's some buildup work that needs to occur there in thinking about when the census is going to happen. Um, I guess my personal thought and my recommendation as a staff person is I think you'd have the most success and the most ability to move forward in an impactful way by really working as a human rights commission and tapping into what already exists um, and using the information that's free um, from the Census Bureau, which is very comprehensive and I think informative. Um, and just you know, putting a concentrated effort behind that to think about how can we just use the networks that already exist, use the information that's free, and get that out there so that people can raise awareness and be understanding what's going on. Um, that's, I guess that would be my recommendation, but um, you all can talk about what you think is best. Well, I think the goals that list here that he handed out, the complete, com com the complete count committee is motivating, educating, informing, involving, and increasing response rate. We can do without a formal committee. We can do as a commission ourselves. Which I think is what Nate was just saying. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I said it in plus words. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're much more, much more efficient in your speech. <laughs> That's also a lot of what we're going to be doing at River City Days. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I, I think, agree. I, I think um, between now and River City, we wouldn't have any time to really work on that. And then we're cutting ourselves short because we, by the time we recruit from, I mean, we have to make a presentation to the city council. We have to try to obtain some funds and, um, and then get other business organizations involved in it. I, I think we're, we're kind of running out of time for all that. But I would like to see, like, us uh, between January, maybe between after Martin Luther King Day to the 1st of August or of April when the census count starts, is maybe do some educational mm -hmm. workshops in mm -hmm. various communities that we think might be less likely to fill out their census. That's a good idea. Because my question was, do we know what the makeup of the 85% participation is? Because it would be important to maybe identify the groups that are in that 15% mm. that we could maybe reach out to more um, mm. and, and reassure them and educate them about why it's important to participate. Sure. You know, I don't know, I guess maybe that could be a question to uh, Jim Accurso um, over the Census Bureau, whether they have, if they're able to share that sort of detailed information. Um, I think from a broad level, I remember from his presentation, what he talked about is, are the populations that, you know, speak English as a second language or maybe don't speak English at all, um, people who are homeless, um, elderly, um, I'm missing a group here, I feel like. I'm sure I'm missing some groups. Well, but I know that, he had said something about people that live in like facilities and stuff yep. too. Yeah. So I think at a national level, you know, he was able to speak to that general mm -hmm. trend and whether that applies to Chaska and there's probably some differences, but I think that would probably be a good rule of thumb mm -hmm. um, to be thinking about where in Chaska do we have, you know, those populations and where are we, where are they living or, you know, where are they congregating? Um, what, are the, what are the organizations that interact with them most frequently? And I think the benefit of working through, if we think about those organizations, there's already an established relationship there. So you're, you're sort of using or being able to build on the trust that they already have established with those populations rather than just coming in as an unknown person mm -hmm. um, and expecting to have that trust. Just it, Sometimes that can be difficult. So some of the organizations that come to my mind would be like Love Inc, um, Launch Ministry. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think maybe maybe the school district they do a lot of outreach. Our Parks Department um, does a lot of outreach and works with different populations. The Lodge. Um, the Lodge, yep. Um, Riverview Terrace. We maintain a relationship with the owner of, of Riverview Terrace, and he. Um, my sense is he has a very positive relationship with a lot of the people that live there. Um, and he does a lot. He does a lot of partnerships with different organizations. Um, so I think that would be something that we could look towards. Um, Julie Janke is our community outreach um, officer. Um, so she's someone that I think we could talk to and work with. So there's 
there's a lot of groups like that that I would, I think, you know, we could easily talk to and um, be working with. So I'm thinking if we get some of these materials and get to know them well, mm -hmm. then later in the winter we could come up with some subcommittee that would like to go out and offer, you know, can we just come and talk to your group for a half hour right. and, and just kind of explain what we've learned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was going to say we could door knock, but then I remembered it was January. <laughs> <laughs> no. You can door knock. Yeah. <laughs> well, is this something we want to talk more about in, say, the August meeting after we get through River City Days? and maybe we'll have read more. Yeah, then we'll have a chance to have read through all the material too. Mm -hmm. It might be since this is a topic that you're gonna be featuring at, at the River City's booth, I'm sure you'll receive feedback. So it'll be nice to kind of mm -hmm. um, reflect on that and maybe that'll inform some paths forward too. So we'll talk more about it in August and in July at River City Day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll move on to new business and item 7A, um, the Chaska Farmers Market. Uh, did you have a. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's on the back. Yeah, I, didn't I had another thing. <laughs> uh, do you want to talk about this or? leave it to you madam chair <laughs> if you if you want to start and I can fill in because um, you're you're definitely a, a leader on this topic I would say right you're part of the group well that's I'm part of the group that, yeah. that I think we need a name for that group because I never know what to call it <laughs> but um, I have been working with some of the leaders in the city of Chaska um, as well as some leaders from district 112 we've been talking a lot about race and equity and inclusion, um, different ways that our community can make all people feel welcome and safe. Um, and there are definitely some bigger projects in the works, but one of the things we came up with at one of our previous meetings was um, something we could do quickly is that we could um, have more diverse entertainment and food um, at our farmers markets this summer. And there was a few dates that still weren't booked with different entertainment. And so a group of the parents from the school, including me, um, have reached out to a, a few people. Um, we're going to have a Latino night that possibly will have a mariachi band and then hopefully um, a food truck to go along with that. And then um, one night we will have a Somali singer, hopefully. And then another night, some sort of African-American entertainment, whether it's a singer or dancer <coughs> band, we're not sure yet, but each of them will try and include <coughs> a um, food truck that also um, highlights that group that we're, that we're featuring that night. Um, and then hopefully that will get more people down to the farmer's market, have more of the community all involved with each other and just kind of celebrate the people that make up our community. Um, so when we came up with this idea, we were very excited about it. And then we thought, well, if we're gonna have entertainment that will probably cost some money. So um, one of the things we had discussed is that the Human Rights Commission has a budget that we are looking for things to support throughout the community during the year. And we still have some money left over, <coughs> so maybe we could commit some money to this entertainment. None of it has been secured. We don't have a price or anything yet, but if we came up with an amount that we're willing to um, donate or 
at least commit towards this, then we could go and get more serious about getting the entertainment book. Now, so this is, this is coming out of discussions that have been going on around, I don't know, the, the equity discussions, I guess, where the school, the school <coughs> district, the city, um, city of Carver has been involved, Jen is representing the Human Rights Commission, um, and then a couple parents who are representing, you know, sort of speaking on behalf of the parent groups that have really raised this issue for the community. And so, um, other things have come out of that, and you know, things that the school district is planning to do, um, things that the city is planning to do, and uh, you know, other community dialogues that are being um, are in the works of being planned and will be will be held later this year. Um, but yeah, to Jen's point, this is something that the group felt um, is a more immediate thing that could really interact with the community, um, you know, using and building on an event that's already occurring. So. We have had discussions with the, with the Southwest Metro Chamber of Commerce, who are the, is the group that hosts and organizes the farmer's market. Um, they're excited about the idea. They think it's, it's a great idea. Um, Jeff Filipek is their president and actually was on the Human Rights Commission um, for a little while until he had to move out of, move out of town um, to a neighboring community. So, uh, you know, this is a topic that he personally has an interest in um, and supports, and from the chamber's perspective, they see it as a good way to build community, which is a part of their mission, so it, it makes sense. It's also a fun event. We talked about that with both the city and the school district, we have some um, more serious conversations planned, and, and this can be just a really family friendly event. You go out, you have fun. You go to the farmer's market anyway. You see your neighbors, you know, have some fun music and um, just enjoy. So everything is not so weedy, you know, because um, there's a place for both. And so we want to try and have some fun events planned for families. I think one of the reasons that um, the group moved towards featuring Somali, pop, Somali culture, African-American culture, and Hispanic culture is because those are groups that are probably higher population within the city of Chaska, um, maybe a little bit more prominent as a result of that. Um, there are other you know, diverse communities in Chaska, um, so it's not intended to leave anyone out, but it was more just kind of, well, we've got three, um, three weeks to feature um, different groups, and so it makes sense to maybe maybe feature the groups that are um, just larger by population in the city of Chaska. And then next year we can include mm -hmm. other groups too. So one thing I did in my uh, report for you all on this topic was look at the dollars that we have and sort of upcoming expenditures that we might expect. Um, so we've got the $1,630 that I reported earlier tonight. Um, I do need to purchase name tags, shirts, and business cards for our new members yet. Um, so I'm thinking $100 should be sufficient for that. Um, we did spend last year $350 to advertise the Human Rights Commission Award. Um, so assuming that we want to do that again. So that was, I think we ran a couple ads in the Herald. Um, I think maybe Kevin did a couple Facebook boosts or something like that. Um, so that's what those dollars were spent on. If we want to do something similar, we could expect to have that. Um, $50 to, for the River City Days booth, so that's just the fee that they charge everyone um, to participate. Um, and then I'm just thinking maybe we set aside about $200 for MLK Day. Usually there's a little bit of incidental expenses as far as um, some of the food and things like that that we try to offer for that event. Um, it's not a high expense event because a lot of things are donated. Um, but we do usually have a little bit there. So accounting for that, we still have about $930 that would remain uncommitted at this point in the year. Um, so I think, you know, thinking about the presentation that Stacy had, um, you know, maybe there's dollars that we want to put towards that. Um, but, you know, thinking about three different entertainment um, groups, I don't know. I'm not tuned in well enough to know what a reasonable amount is um, for these groups, but I would assume it's probably maybe a couple hundred dollars or something like that. Um, it just kind of depends on the group and how prominent they are usually. But 
So I just did math and looking at Stacy's proposed budget on hers, which we haven't decided if we're doing, but um, that would leave us with $680 left. So if we were thinking that entertainment ran around $200 each for three groups, that would be $600. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that that's just a ballpark figure that maybe we could go on. Would the chamber kick in any money? I don't, I know the chamber has a pretty well set budget for the farmer's market. Um, I think they already had I, spent yeah. their budget for it the because budget they did the other, um, the other weeks so far, they paid oh, for those. Okay. Plus they have, I mean, they also used that money for other programs within the farmer's market. Um, they have a produce for kids um, where they, the kids get a coin that they can go and pick out a piece of produce and then the chamber reimburses the vendors for that and stuff. So they, they had money set aside, but um, it's already been spoken for now. So that's why we came up with the idea that maybe the Human Rights Commission could help. How realistic do you think her like facilitation fee is? Yes, for... I'm worried about that. I yeah, too. Yeah. I can't believe anybody would do it for uh, that. I mean, that would be one to me, one event's facilitation. Unless, I mean, if she has relationships that she can get people to come in and, and donate their time. But I would think you're looking at a minimum of 150 for a night. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought. That's too. it. Mm -hmm. Which, I mean, I'm not saying either thing, but I do think that that budget is like. Well, do we need to save $200 for MLK prior to the end of the year? Is that spent on advertising or something, or can that come, the food That's could come out of next year's budget, before right? Though. It it could come out. We could say next year's budget is going to cover um, the 2020 MLK. That that is something that could be done. Um, what I was, you know, I was just kind of putting together what we've done yeah. in the past, trying to you know apply it here. The $200 um, we do last year, we did have some expenses to provide some of the. Um, the coffee service and I think there were some tablecloths and things like that that we had to pay um, the catering company at the event center to be able to have staff to go and do that um, that was I think really the only well and then we also I, I recall we purchased from Red Bench at, co at cost mm -hmm. um, those bakery items yeah. that were given out so that's where those co those expenses came from but, um, but but yeah you're right that could be something that could come out of the 2020 um, right. How about any advertising of it, or does the chamber do that? The, al the advertising. Wouldn't it be in the um, Herald? We didn't put any dollars towards that last year, okay. um, so we just. Do you mean for the MLK the, or for the yeah, for MLK or I'm just market? Saying that we, if it's just food, we could probably move that into the next budget if we need that money yep. to fund these things. Yeah, that could be done. the The advertising, we didn't pay anything. We didn't have any expenditures okay. on that last year. I guess just personally, knowing what I do about, and, and I have not played in a band for a long time, but um, like I don't think I would, I think $500 is a reasonable amount, um, and then you work to find folks. I mean, there's exposure pieces there too. There's most of the people that are going to, and this is not being dismissive of anybody that's going to come play a farmer's market, but like, we're, so we're not First Avenue, right? Like, right. like um, there's a big exposure piece there too in terms of getting out in front of the community and playing. So I guess my recommendation would be that we approve no more than $500 to support it given the other things that we still have going on and, and whether that's ex more facilitators or something else that comes up in the next six months that we can't see now. Um, the idea of kind of having spent pretty much all of that um, in June makes me a little nervous in terms of other potential events that may come to us. I guess I would like to have a little more wiggle room too still for, I mean, we haven't even talked about if we're going to do this race video thing or how we feel about that. Mm -hmm. so. And I'm not, I'm not making a motion for 500, but that to me would be the, the highest that I would be comfortable with in terms of approving. Well, <laughs> I'm 
I'm not sure what, I don't know what, I mean, we all know we want a lower amount. Um, I mean, I think 500 sounds reasonable. Well, it's even, up to 500. I mean, right, it's not, it wouldn't necessarily sure. be. Yeah, and, and what we're doing is just saying that we can commit to mm -hmm. that, you know. We, we have not talked to the musicians or the entertainment yet, so we don't know for sure what it would be. Um, and You know, one, one way to look at it, too, would be, <clears throat> I don't recall exactly what the, what the dates are of these openings, but I, I know they're spread out throughout the rest of the farmer's market. So the farmer's market runs through September 11th. Yeah. Um, I think giving the $500 definitely gives Jen an opportunity to go forward and start talking to some of these musicians. Um, if it turns out that it's looking like it won't be sufficient, there's still time to have more discussion here with you all and think about, do you want to go that route? Um, the other thing to keep in mind is there's probably other ways that we can pursue getting dollars also, mm -hmm. which can be a positive thing too, because then you're developing partners and broader support. Um, so it, that, that could be a way to look at it. I thought I had the dates, but I don't have them with me. But they are like the end of July and August, mm -hmm. I think. So that is something we could talk about. Who, who is responsible for obtaining this music? Um, there's three parents in this group that we've been working with, and so um, each of us said we would reach out to a certain community. Um, okay. Like I'm working with the Somali community right now and have some leads on that. Okay. But I haven't. So you're looking for people in this area? Um, if we can find Yeah, the way. person that I, I'm thinking about for entertainment on the Somali night is not in Chaska, but he's actually performed at Chaska Middle School before. Um, and then he lives in Minneapolis. So, I mean, he's sort of local. Mm -hmm. um, well, Stacy Nelson Kumar is another person um, who's been involved in that discussion. And then Tanya Coleman mm -hmm. um, has, has been okay. involved. And, and they've both sort of been representing the parent perspective in these discussions that have been involving the city and the school district. And, So we're just reaching out through connections that we have to find yeah. people that okay. know people who like to perform. And so um, we haven't made any offers to anyone yet because we don't know what kind of funding is available. So after we make a decision, then we could um, get more clarity on the whole, on the whole plan. I also think like if you're looking to book somebody, you can say what is your usual rate for, um, like I wouldn't start with this saying we have $500 right, full right. and uh, <laughs> like for an hour, I have no idea how long that you're expecting them to play, but mm -hmm. um, you know, given it is early evening, I think, right? But what time does it, it goes till seven? Four to seven. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's four to seven. Yeah, um, um, that's certainly anybody who's got a gig later in the evening can both like you're not it's we, we're done early enough that they can right. get what they need to be so um, I would think that most of them can tell you sort of what their standard for that is so I, Chris's band made three hundred dollars playing at Ziggy's and Hudson so <laughs> that's like a five piece person band <laughs> like on a Friday night with a big crowd yes <laughs> yeah. yes okay. Yeah, I think that would be the way to go is to ask what their general rate is. Well, because I think, like, if we have, I think Nate's right, I think that there are businesses that might consider co-sponsoring um, mm -hmm. some of that. I mean, especially mm -hmm. if you've got um, groups that have connections to the community, that there may be some folks that we can go to that would pitch in a little bit to help support that, too. Sure. Well... So should we make a motion for a maximum amount that we're willing to commit for tonight? Because that will give us kind of a launching point for meeting with the possible entertainers. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess I'm just concerned that 
we're not going to have any money in the end for the other presentation. I don't know what we want to commit to that either. I mean, we can't, we can't really do 500 for both, could we? I would hate to commit everything in mm -hmm. the June meeting mm -hmm. for the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. We're back in we're back in July, right? Yes. So we can start low, and you'd have enough to book at least the first act, probably. Right. Worst case scenario, and you can come back. Not low, and low but lower than five hundred. Mm -hmm. Should we start with two hundred dollars? That would at least should be good for one reasonable. act. Like three, like to me, three seems okay. like if, if you want to try to book three. You at least have some place to start with there. But. Okay, do I have a motion? I guess I'm moving to prove up to $300. I'll second. All in favor of committing three up to $300 for the farmer's market entertainment? Aye. Aye. I'm sorry. Say aye, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, okay, well, we sort of unanimously approved that. Um, I think that's a good idea, though, to just start low, and then we can add to it once we get a better idea of what's going on. Um, also, think about maybe some partnerships we can do to get some funds from other places. So. But I'm really excited about adding this to the farmer's market. And I think that in the future, maybe we can, you know, learn more about it and then be able to budget better for it if we want to be involved in future farmer's markets that way. I would make a motion that we approve up to $300 for the race thing at this point, too. And then that way we could, oh. Is that thunder or what? I don't know. No. No? I think it's the air system. Oh. Oh, so directly below us is a garage. <laughs> um, so it's the, a garage. The police department uses it. Yeah. So oh. it's, it's a garage. I thought road. it was thunder and I kept <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Um, should we do the motions before we do discussion, or? So you can you no. can do a motion. Um, there is a motion that's been made. Right. Um, so if there's no second, then the motion dies. There is opportunity to have discussion. Um, so you could do a motion. If there's a second, then there's you could op you could offer up the opportunity for discussion before taking a vote. Um, so there is a motion right now. There is a motion. So um, either someone makes a second and then you can have discussion or someone doesn't make a second and the motion dies, you can still have discussion. Um, a motion could still be made if this motion dies later. It just needs to be a different motion. So we have a motion. Do we have a second for $300 committed to the uh, race video and discussion? We don't have to vote on it right away after the motion. We can discuss it. Or we just can discuss or it. Or we can just discuss it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there was no second. Right. So this motion dies. You can still discuss it. You can make a different motion. We're learning, Nate. We've only yeah. been here a couple of years. That's okay. <laughs> they didn't go over this in the training, okay. the motion part of it. Yeah. yeah we, didn't, we didn't dive into parliamentary procedures. No. Uh, rules. <laughs> Okay, well then let's talk about it. Um, I think making that commitment tonight would be an important step because given the time frame that Stacy was thinking and the reasoning behind it, because getting things out before school starts and things get crazy again, um, I think is a, a good idea. I. I'm not sure how easy it's going to be to get it done that quickly. 
but if we're going to try to do that, we need to have some funds in place so that we can just dive in when we do it. Well, and I'm not sure of her exact expectations of us posting it or are we finding the places and the dates and I got the, the feeling her approach was for us to do all of this. That's I what my impression was too. Yeah, yeah that I have an idea, but you guys take it and run with it is what she wants us to do. I, I'm not going to speak for Stacy, and we can check with her for sure, but um, I get the feeling that she would partner with us and help us out in ways that she could. Um, she's been through this before where she, she went through the um, classes or what, the discussions of this video series and just was really moved by how powerful they were. And so she thinks it would be an important addition to our community. Um, and one person can't plan it, but she came to us because we could help her with getting that out to the community. And so I think, you know, if we had specific things that we needed her help on, I think she would probably be willing to help with that. But I think, you know, as a city commission, we have the access to the different spaces and things like that. Um, the school district already has the video, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, so yes, it, it would be us that kind of pull it together and are the glue for it, but I think that a lot of it would kind of just fall into place because of who's going to be partnering on this. I think we could find a facility and do the logistics of setting up tables and doing some advertising for it and sending it out to other groups that we know to try to get people here. I just feel like um, I wouldn't be qualified to, to find a facilitator and I wouldn't be interested in, in doing that. I think somebody like her should um, do find the facilitators and do that homework because perhaps you know whoever whoever puts out this video maybe has some suggestions too so I, yeah that's that's just my feeling i mean i think we could help financially logistically and advertising yeah and i think she there. said that she's willing to help us make some connections or reach out to the the people that she knows um so i think we could start with that, you know, working with her on finding the facilitator rather than us going out and looking for someone. Yeah, it's those words, help us. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Make me nervous. Well, should I contact her and find out how much she would want to work on this before we I make it? I'm sorry. I think she's really committed to this. Like, I don't have any hesitation that she wouldn't help use her network to, I mean, if anybody's going to get somebody to donate in-kind facilitation services, it's going to be her because she's worked with these people through her position. So that, I'm, I'm not concerned about finding, helping her helping us find facilitators. I think that, um, that, that uh, when she says she will help, she means that she will do what she can to make those connections and, and get those folks in the room. So that's just my two cents. What about if we were talking about 50 people come in groups of 10 and each table has a person, all those people? Well, that's the part that I was wondering about too. Like, would, would it be that we maybe make this like a Facebook event where people RSVP or, you know, um, so we have an idea of how many people are coming because if we need to have more than one facilitator, then that's going to take some more time and commitment because there will have to be either training of the people asking the questions at the tables or, um, or getting more than one facilitator. 
to come in. You could require tickets through Eventbrite. They could be free, yeah. but, you'd, but they'd have to have a ticket. So you'd have a count. At least you'd have a maximum count if people didn't share. But. Yeah, that, that seems like it would make more sense than just hoping that a certain number show up and then we either have three people or 150 people, then mm -hmm. we aren't going to be prepared for that. I guess, I guess the other thing to consider is we don't have to do this in July and August. Um, you know, in some timeline, doing it before school starts might be beneficial, might also stir things up too. Um, like doing it in the fall after school gets started, maybe around Marnita's table or some of the other community engagement events that we're doing. Um, you know, I think it sounds like there's a number of questions, and so maybe it's let's have some conversations before the next meeting and come back to it at that point. Like, it's, that's an, I mean, it's, for all intents and purposes, an artificial timeline. Um, so there's no reason that we can't, I mean, I think everybody here is interested in it. There's no reason we can't do some more exploration around the facilitation. Mm -hmm. Well, and especially in securing a facilitator, the mm -hmm. short timeline would be, be challenging or mm -hmm. get someone. I just think if, if we gave her a, a small budget of say $300, then she would have something to work with and could be secure in starting that process and report back to us at the next one. Maybe, maybe she'll need more, maybe she won't, but if we don't start now, it's gonna be hard to do it before mm -hmm. the school, school year. I agree. I really like the idea of maybe waiting till fall to do it. Mm -hmm. I feel like I don't, I wouldn't want this to be rushed. Mm -hmm. I think it's important and I think it needs to be well done. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not saying we couldn't do it, but I think we could do a better job if we gave it a little more planning. Well, and that, frankly, we might know what the budget is then and whether we need to be looking at other partners for that too. Just a little bit, a little bit of context I want to provide. Um, thank you, Commissioner Hagner, or I'm sorry, Haga, for um, making the point. There's out of this, out of these conversations that the school district, city, um, parent groups have been involved in, city of Carver as well. Um, it has been a lot of talk about community discussion, um, community dialogue. What, what is a way to host that and, ha and create a forum for that to occur? I think this, um, what's being proposed here is one approach to do that. Um, Commissioner Haga touched on um, Marnita's table, um, and you may not all be familiar with what that is, but I think that is something that the, that the group working together has quite a bit of interest in doing. I think that is something that we're gonna move forward with. Marnita's table is, um, it's a group, they're, they're an organized group, and what they do is they host community dialogues they bring in food, um, and typically what they want to do is try and bring in ethnic food um, that relates to the conversation at hand. Um, and then bringing people together for that meal, to, to sit down and have a meal together, which often then kind of sets a tone for a nice conversation to occur. Um, and so they bring in facilitators, um, they host a dialogue, and you know the goal of that is to talk about what people have on their mind and what their concerns are, or where they think the community needs to go, and hopefully to inform goals and actions that come out of that. Um, so that's the intent of that, and that's what that would look like. What we've been talking about is that that would happen sometime, maybe just before or right around the time that school starts, um, towards the end of summer, early fall, um, having that happen. So I think I just offer that up as context um, to think about how this fits in with that and the timing of it. Um, not to say that they can't all happen um, or that they can't all happen around the same time, but I think it's relevant um, for you guys to be thinking about it, and especially as you're thinking about the timing of this and what was proposed tonight and what makes sense. Um, Marnita's table may offer up room, you know, to sort of say, okay, we know that's happening. We know this fire, um, farmer's market activity is happening. Um, maybe this is something that happens later on, I don't know, just an option to be thinking about. 
I think that's important too because um, in the group discussions with the city and the school district, we've discussed how this is not, a, we do this and it's done. This is gonna be an ongoing thing. And so if we could you know, spread it out after other events are occurring, then we can keep discussions going and uh, the dialogue going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, the way to look at it would be this, like the Martita's, I'm sorry, Marnita's table um, event as an example, uh, could be a way to get a list um, of folks that you would then have already expressed interest in this sort of thing. Um, you could then market this next dialogue or conversation viewing um, that's being proposed directly to those folks. These, you start to build your audience maybe that way. Very good Just idea. A thought. Okay. So in August and September? Uh, there's no specific date set, but I think we're talking about early fall. Mm -hmm. Whatever that looks like, I'm not sure yet. But. So even if we, I mean, maybe we could get start getting this planned for October-ish, early November. But if we have a date, then at that, the table discussion, Marnita's table, we can say, hey, here's also what's happening, too. Mm -hmm. At mm -hmm. this date and time, be here. Well, I don't, I mean, we can't plan a date tonight for sure because no. we don't know the date of the Marnita's table, but um, I think that's a good time to mention things like that, yeah. So maybe if we do, we give her a little, the $300 or whatever, let her start looking at dates for October, early November, something for facilitators. I just, I'm over the perspective we don't need to make a motion on dollars tonight. I think we can have the conversation with her. We can start figuring, assessing what um, what a facilitator really looks like in terms of cost and bill out a budget that's that's based on some realistic numbers and then figure out, um, again, if we need to identify some other partners to, to if we want to move forward with it, um, like the school district doing more than providing the video, which I think there's capacity for that too. Um, so. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess my, my uh, personal feeling is that we don't need to approve any dollars tonight. I think we have the conversation with Stacy. follow up with Stacy and then we come back with a better budget um, and give ourselves the time to do it, right? I think so, too. follow up with Stacy and come back next month and talk about what we've learned. Um, is there any other new business tonight? Look like you have something, Ellen. I was at a school board meeting on Monday night and the group of people, there was a very different group of presenters there and it was a result of um, a Facebook post, and I just brought a copy of that because I keep thinking if there's any doubt in our mind that um, what we're doing right now, the city and the school board, to address the issue of um, racial um, racism, discrimination, discrimination um, cultural bias, bigotry, so I, again, I just I brought a copy of the uh, Facebook post because um, I would just like us to to see it and to uh, <laughs> um, oh, yeah. I didn't quite really know what to do with this other than I just found it so disturbing when I read it on Monday and then when I was at the school board meeting Monday night to see that there are this many people in them. Um, Harbor County who would come and I will say I don't know how many of those people were actually, we're actually from Carver County. County the more research has been done people misinformed the school board as to their actual address and that sort of thing but there is a group of people who are trying to come into our county and infiltrate if you want to use a word that's strong and get people stirred up in a very negative way to a population in our community that we're working very hard to try and integrate and make feel welcome in our community. 
So again, it was more of a, if you have any doubt that uh, this kind of uh, thoughts are happening, they're out there. So that's the only reason why I brought this tonight. Thanks for sharing that. <laughs> Stuff. Pardon me. It's disturbing. It was very disturbing. It. The um, only upside I would say is um, before it was taken down, which is an upside, every comment I saw was very positive in terms of um, in bringing and uh, raising up our community. I did not see anything on this particular Facebook page that supported this statement. But again, just to see that and to have seen the different group that showed up at the school board um, was very unsettling. So, anyway. Do you know if this woman was there? I did not see her name in, as a speaker. I did not hear her name because I was listening to see. Do you remember if it was? No. So, okay. She was not a speaker, but okay. I don't know if she was, was there. Was there. She wasn't a speaker, I do know that I was watching for her name to, or listening for her name. I was too. But whether she was there, I don't know. So. Thanks for sharing. You're welcome. <laughs> okay. Any other new business tonight? I'm hearing none. Then uh, our next meeting date will be the River City Days Eve oh my. on July 25th. So I hope you can all come and we can frantically plan the stuff that we knew <laughs> last minute and, and then we'll go have fun that weekend. Um, and with that, I guess, do I have a motion to adjourn? I um, put forward a motion that we adjourn our meeting this evening. Second. I'll second. Okay. All in favor of adjourning. Aye. 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 Okay. Meeting adjourned.